Hi, I'm Izzy, and today I'm going to be reading a story, so keep watching for the full story. The Piece of String by Guy de Maupassant. It was market day, and over all the roads round Goderville, the peasants and their wives were coming toward the town. The men walked easily, lurching the whole body forward at every step. Their long legs were twisted and deformed by the slow, painful labors of their country. By bending over to plow, which is what also makes their left shoulders too high and their figures crooked, and by reaping corn, which obliges them for steadiness sake to spread their knees too wide, their starched blue blouses shining as though varnished ornamented at collar and cuffs with the little patterns of white stitchwork and blown up big around their bony bodies seemed exactly like balloons about to soar, but putting forth a head, two arms, and two feet. Some of these fellows dragged a cow or a calf at the end of the rope, and just behind the animal, beating it over the back with a leaf-colored branch to hasten its pace, went their wives carrying large baskets from which came forth the heads of chickens or the heads of ducks. These women walked with steps far shorter and quicker than the men. Their figures, withered and upright, were adorned by scanty little slaws pinned up over their flat bosoms and enveloped their heads, each in a white cloth, clothes fastened round the hair and surmitted by a cap. Now a sherbong passed by, drawn by a jerky-paced nag. It shook up strangely the two men on the seat, and the woman at the bottom of the cart held fast to its sides to lessen the hard joltings. In the marketplace at Goderville was a great crowd, a mingled multitude of men and beasts, the horns of cattle, the high and long-napped hats of wealthy peasants, the headdresses of the woman, came to the surface of the sea, and voices, clamorous, sharp, skrill, made a continuous and savage din. Above it, a huge burst of laughter from sturdy lungs of a merry yokel would sometimes sound and sometimes a long bellow from a cow tied fast to the wall of a house. All smelled of the stable, of milk, of hay, and of perspiration, giving off that half-human, half-animal odor, which is peculiar to the men of the fields. Maitre Hatchcorn of Briety had just arrived at Goderville and was taking his way towards the square, when he perceived on the ground a little piece of string. Maitre Hatchcorn, economical like all the true Normans, reflected that everything was worth picking up and could be of any use, and he stopped down, but painfully, because he suffered from rheumatism. He took a bit of a thin cord from the ground and was carefully preparing to roll it up when he saw Maitre Manadin, the harness maker, on his doorstep looking at him. They had both had a quarrel about a halter, and they had remained angry since. Bring out List on both sides, Maitre Hotchcorn was overcome with a sort of shame at being seen by his enemy looking in the dirt so for a bit of string. He quickly hid his find beneath his blouse, then in the pocket of his breeches, then pretended to still be looking for something on the ground, which he did not discover, and at last went off towards the marketplace with his head bent forward and body almost doubled in two by rheumatic pains. He lost himself immediately in the crowd, which was clamorous, slow, and agitated by intermediate bargains. The peasants exclaimed the cows, went off, came back, always in great perplexity and fear of being cheated, never quite daring to decide, spying at the eye of the seller, trying ceaselessly to discover the tricks of the man and the defect in the beast. The woman, having placed their great baskets at their feet, had pulled out the poultry, which lay upon the ground, tied by the legs, with eyes scared with combs scarlet, maintaining their prices with a dry manner, with an impassable face, or suddenly, perhaps, deciding to take the lower price which was offered. They cried out to the customer, who was departing slowly. I'll let you have them, mate Atheum. Then, little by little, the square became empty, and when the angelus struck midday, those who lived at distance poured into the inns. 
At Jordan's, the great room was filled with ears, just as the vast court was filled with vehicles of every sort, wagons, gigs, cherubanks, tilburies, tilt carts, which have no name, yellow with mud, misshapen, pieced together, raising their shafts to heaven like two arms, or it may be with their nose in the dirt and their rear in the air. Just opposite to where the diners were at table, the huge fireplace full of clear flame threw a lively heat on the backs of those who sat along the right. Three spits were turning, loaded with chickens, with pigeons, and with joints of mutton, and a delectable odor of roast beef, of gravy gushing over crisp brown skin, took a wing from the hearth, kindled merriment, caused mouths to water. All the aristocracy of the plow were eating there. At Mate Jordan's, the innkeepers, a dealer in horses also, a sharp fellow who had made a pretty penny in his day. The dishes were passed around, were emptied, with jugs of yellow cider. Everyone told of his affairs, of his purchases, and his sales. They asked news about crops. The weather was good for green stuffs and a little wet for wheat. All of a sudden, the drum rolled in the court before the house. Everyone except some of the most indifferent was on his feet at once and ran to the door, to the windows, with his mouth still full and napkin in hand. The public crier had finished his tattoo. He called forth in a jerky voice, making his pauses out of time. B. Be it known to the inhabitants of Goderville, and in general to all, persons present at the market, that there has been lost this morning on Boozleville Road between 9 and 10 o'clock, a pocketbook of black leather containing 500 francs and business papers. You are requested to return it to the mayor's office at once or Chin Holbrecue of Mannyville. There will be 20 francs reward. Then the man departed. They heard once more at a distance the dull beating on the drum and the faint voice of the crier. And they began to talk of this event, reckoning up the chances with Maitre Holbrook had of finding or of not finding his pocketbook again. They were finishing their coffee when the corporal of gendarmes appeared on the threshold. Is Maitre Hotchcorn of Brialtel here? Hotchcorn, seated at the other end of the table, answered, Here I am. The corporal resumed. Mr. Hotchcorn, will you have the kindness to come with me to the mayor's office? Le Maire would like to speak to you. The peasant, surprised and uneasy, gulped down his little glass of cognac, got up, and even worse, bent over than in the morning, since the first steps after a rest were always particularly difficult, starting off repeating. Here I am, here I am, and he followed the corporal. The mayor was waiting for him. Seated in an armchair, he was notary of the place, a tall, grave man of pompous speech. Teacher Hotchcorn, said he, this morning on the Boozville Road, you were seen to pick up the pocketbook lost by Maitre Holbrecht of Mannyville. The countryman, speechless, regarded the mayor, frightened already by the suspicion which rested on him. He knew not why. I, I, picks up that pocketbook? Yes, you. I swear, I didn't even know nothing about it all. You were seen. They saw me? Who is that who saw me? M. Melandon, the harness maker. Then the old man remembered, understood, and reddening with anger. Ah, he saw me, did he, the rascal? He saw me picking up this string here, Monsieur La Mire. And fumbling at the bottom of his pocket, he pulled out of it the little end of string. But the mayor incredulously shook his head. You will not make me believe, Maitre Hotchcorn, that M. Medallion, who is a man worthy of credit, has mistaken this string for a pocketbook. The peasant, furious, raised his hand and spit as 
if to attest his good faith, repeating, For all that, it is the truth of the good God, the blessed truth, Monsieur La Mire, there, in my salvation, I repeat it, the mare continued. After having picked up the thing, in question, you even looked for some time in the mud to see if a piece of money had not dropped out of it. The good man was suffocated with indignation and with fear. Say, if they can say such lies as that to slander an honest man, if they can say he might protested he was not believed. He was confronted with M. Melandon, who repeated and sustained his testimony. They abused one another for an hour. At his own request, Maitre Hotchcorn was searched. Nothing was found upon him. At last, the mayor, much perplexed, sent him away, warning him that he would inform the public prosecutor and ask for orders. The news had spread. When he left the mayor's office, the old man was surrounded, interrogated with curiosity which was serious or mocking as the case might be, but into which no indignation entered, and he began to tell the story of the string. They did not believe him. They laughed. He passed on, buttonholed by everyone, himself buttonholding his acquaintances, beginning over and over again his tale and protestations, showing his pockets, turning inside out to prove that he had nothing. They said to him, You old rogue, va? Rated, feverish in despair at not being believed and always telling his story. The night came. It was time to go home. He set out with three of his neighbors, to whom he pointed out the place where he had picked up the end of the string, and all the way he talked of his adventure. That evening he made the rounds in the village of Briate, so as we tell everyone he met only unbelievers. He was ill of it all night long. Today, about one in the afternoon, Marius Pamele, a farmhand of Maitre Britain, the market gardener at Yamalville, returned the pocketbook and its contents to Maitre Holbrecht of Mannyville. This man said, indeed, that he had found it on the road, but not knowing how to read, he had carried it home and given it to his master. The news spread to the environs. Maitre Hodgecorn was informed. He put himself at once upon the go and began to relate his story as completed by the denouement. He triumphed. What grieved me, said he, was not the thing itself, do you understand, but it was the lies. There's nothing does you so much harm as being in disgrace for lying. All day he talked of his adventure. He told it on the roads to the people who passed, at the cabaret to the people who drank, and the next Sunday when they came out to church. He even stopped strangers to tell them about it. He was easy now, and yet something worried him without his knowing exactly what it is. People had a joking manner while they listened. They did not seem convinced. He seemed to feel their tittle-tattle behind his back.